everyone and welcome back to my channel Holy Humanist. I hope everyone's having a wonderful start to 2022 and since it had been a while since I did a solo video I thought it's about time I discuss this issue which kind of really got under my skin. So today we're going to discuss red flags in the Quran. One of the major claims that Islam makes for itself and rests its foundation on is the fact that the Quran is the unaltered immutable word of God. Um, according to Muslims, the word of God has always been in existence and was eventually compiled into the Quran as we know it today. Now, despite going into all the major problems with that claim, because that would be one hell of a long video, I'm going to overlook a certain number of things. These include the fact that there are many different variations of the Quran. These include the Sana manuscript and the Birmingham manuscript, for instance, and they all slightly differ from each other. I'm also going to ignore the fact that the Quran was initially written on bits of stalk, leaves and animal hide, and about 360 hafaz, meaning people who had memorized the Quran, were killed, and also a piece of the Quran was eaten by a tame sheep, thankfully. I'm also going to overlook the fact that the Quran is full of contradictions, despite itself stating that if this were not a book from Allah, then you would find in it many contradictions. Uh, Quran 4.82 I am also going to overlook all the scientific errors in the Quran, such as the sun sets in a muddy spring, the world was created in six days, the earth is flat, the sun orbits the earth, shooting stars are missiles to stop the devils eavesdropping on heaven, sperm comes from between the backbones and the ribs, an embryo is formed from a clot of blood and then into bones, the mountains are pegs that hold the earth in place, God sits on a throne of water, and that the sun requires the permission of God to rise every morning, etc, etc. If we keep going, we'll be here all day. I'm also going overlook the historical inaccuracies in the Quran. Uh, Vulcanen in the Quran is neither Alexander the Great nor Cyrus the Great, as we're often told by Muslims. Um, secondly, Aaron is not the brother of Mary as mentioned in the Quran. They lived thousands of years apart. I'm also going to overlook the fact that Jews don't consider Ezra as a god. It's completely against Jewish theology. Uh, we're also going to overlook the fact that King Solomon could not talk to animals and could not summon jinns that are non-existent to perform magic or miracles miracles for him. And we're also going to overlook the fact that Abraham did not build the first Gaba. And even if we agree, for argument's sake, that he even existed ever, he was nowhere near Mecca, but from Ur, which is in Mesopotamia, near Nasriya in modern day Iraq, etc, etc. Again, if we carry on looking into the historical inaccuracies, we'll be here all day. I'm also going to ignore the logical inconsistencies, the numerical inconsistencies, and all the misogyny, sexism, slavery, hate speech and warmongering that we find in the Quran. I want to focus on three major red flags um, that fly in the face of the claim that this is the word of God. First and foremost are the satanic verses. Second is Umar ibn Khattab's contribution to the Quran. And thirdly, and perhaps the most damaging, is the incident concerning Muhammad's scribe, Abdullah ibn Sahar, who became an apostate the moment he clocked that there was nothing divine about what Muhammad was saying, as Muhammad actually added Abdullah ibn Sahar's random words into the Quran because Muhammad thought they sounded pleasant. Don't believe me? Well, let's dive into 7th century Arabia and see what was happening. First, let's examine the Quran verse that in itself is considered to be blasphemous, yet made it into the codified Quran as the word of God that we have today. Now, according to the Islamic tradition, on at least one occasion, the holy words of Allah were polluted by the whispers of Satan. According to all of the great biographers of the Prophet, Satan whispered into the ears of Muhammad in what is known as the Satanic Verses Incident, or the Gharanik Incident, which literally translates to cranes in Arabic. Satan corrupted a divine verse from Allah and turned it into an invitation to shirk or to associate partners with Allah, which is the biggest crime in Islam.
And in this instance, Satan did that in the form of worship of the daughters of Allah, Allah, Al-Uzza and Manat. This appears in the Quran's Surah An-Najm, chapter 53, verse 19 to 22. So have you considered Allah and Al-Uzza and Manat the third one, the other? These were deities worshipped by the Meccan pagans alongside Allah at their shrine, the Kaaba. This verse was not only welcomed by the Meccan pagans, but they endeared Muhammad for giving their idol significance. Prior to the revelation of this verse, the Meccan pagans had been dismayed by Muhammad's attack on their gods and his declarations that their ancestors were in hell. Narrated Ibn Abbas, the Prophet performed a prostration when he finished reciting Surah an najm and all the Muslims and pagans and jinns and human beings prostrated along with him. Sahih Bukhari 660-385 Now, according to Ibn Hisham in The Life of Muhammad, the Sirat Rasulullah, the biography of the Prophet, um, this is what the extract reads relating to this incident. Now the Apostle was anxious for the welfare of his people, wishing to attract them as far as he could. It had been mentioned that he longed for a way to attract them, and the method he adopted is what Ibn Hamid told me that Salama said to Muhammad bin Ishaq told him from Yazid bin Zayed of Medina, from M.B. Ka'ab al Qurayzi. When the Apostle saw that his people turned their backs on him, and he was pained by their estrangement from what he bought them from God, he longed that there should come to him from God a message that would reconcile his people to him. Because of his love for his people and his anxiety over them, it would delight him if the obstacle that made his task so difficult could be removed, so that he meditated on the project and longed for it and it was dear to him. Then God sent down, by the star when it sets your comrade as not and is not deceived, he speaks not from his own desire. And when he reached his words, have you thought of Allah and Al-Uzza and Manat the third, the other? Satan, when he was meditating upon it and desiring to bring it, i.e. Re reconciliation to his people, put upon his tongue, these are the exalted Gharanik whose intercession is approved. When Quraysh heard that, they were delighted and greatly pleased at the way in which he spoke of their gods and they listened to him. While the believers were holding that what their prophet brought them from their Lord was true, not suspecting a mistake or a vain desire or a slip. And when he reached the prostration and the end of the surah in which he prostrated himself, the Muslims prostrated themselves when their prophet prostrated, confirming what he bought and obeying his command. And the polytheists of Quraysh and others who were in the mosque prostrated when they heard the mention of their gods, so that everyone in the mosque, believer and unbeliever, prostrated, except Al-Walid bin al mughira who was an old man who could not do so, so he took a handful of dirt from the valley and bent over it. Then the people dispersed and Quraysh went out, delighted at what had been said about their gods, saying, Muhammad has spoken of our gods in splendid fashion. He alleged in what he read that they are the exalted Gharanik, whose intercession session is approved. Muhammad's followers were no doubt dismayed and shocked by Muhammad's declaration and embracing this shirk. According to Ibn Hisham, the followers of the Prophet who had emigrated to the land of Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia as we know it today, heard about the affair of the prostration and it was reported to them that Quraysh had accepted Islam. Some men among them decided to return while others remained. Gabriel came to the Prophet and said, O Muhammad, what have you done? You have recited to the people something which I have not brought to you from God, and you have spoken what he did not say to you. Muhammad would later retract the verse, declaring it to be the work of Satan. This appears in the Quran in chapter 22, verse 52 to 53. The Quran reads, Never did we send a messenger or a prophet before thee, but when he framed a desire, Satan threw some vanity into his desire, but Allah will cancel anything vain that Satan throws in, and Allah will confirm and establish signs, for Allah is full of knowledge and wisdom, that he may make the suggestions thrown in by Satan, but a trial for those in whose heart is a disease, and who are hardened of heart. Verily, the wrongdoers are in a schism far from the truth. He goes on to say that the prophet was mightily saddened and greatly feared God, but God of his mercy sent him a revelation, comforting him and diminishing the magnitude of what had happened.
God told him that there had never been a previous prophet or apostle who had longed just as Muhammad had longed and desired just as Muhammad had desired, but that Satan had cast into his longing just as he had cast onto the tongue of Muhammad. God abrogates what Satan has cast and puts his verses in proper order. That is, you are just like other prophets and apostles. So God drove out the sadness from his prophet and gave him security against what he feared. He abrogated what Satan had cast upon his tongue in referring to their gods. They are the high-flying Gharanik, whose intercession is accepted, replacing those words with the words of God when Alat al-Uzza and Manat the third, the other, are mentioned. The Quran chapter 53 verse 21 to 26 reads, Is the male for you and for him the female? That then is an unjust division. They are not but mere names you have named them, you and your forefathers, for which Allah has sent down no authority. They follow not except assumption and what their souls desire, and there has already come to them from their Lord guidance. Or is there for man whatever he wishes? Rather, to Allah belongs the hereafter and the first life. And how many angels there are in the heavens whose intercession will not avail at all, except only after Allah has permitted it to whom he wills and approves. Indeed, those who do not believe in the hereafter name the angels female names. This is Quran chapter 53 verse 21 to 26, meaning how can the intercession of their gods be of any avail with him? When there had come from God the words which abrogated what Satan had cast onto the tongue of his prophet, the Quraysh said, Muhammad has gone back on what he said about the status of our gods relative to God, changed it and bought something else. For the two phrases which Satan had cast onto the tongue of the prophet had found a place in the mouth of every polytheist. They therefore increased in their evil and in their oppression of everyone among them who had accepted Islam and followed the prophet. Later commentators, theologians and scholars have questioned the incident, with modern scholars noting that this incident provides a very good rationale for the doctrine of nusk or abrogation. Nevertheless, this incident is a well-documented Islamic tradition with attestation by Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, Ibn Sa'ad, Al-Dabari, Al-Waqidi, and Bukhari, amongst others. This is the tafsir of Ibn Kathir relating to Quran, chapter 22, verses 52 to 53. When he spoke, the shaitan threw some falsehood into his speech, but Allah abolished that which the shaitan had thrown in. When he did recite the revelation, shaitan threw some falsehood in it. When he spoke, the shaitan threw some falsehood into his speech, Mujahid said. Here is the tafsir of Al-Jalalain on the same incident. And we did not send before you any messenger, Rasul. This is the prophet who has been commanded to deliver a message, or prophet Nabi, who, one who has not been commanded to deliver anything, but that when he recited the scripture, Satan cast into his recitation what is not from the Quran, but which those to whom he, the prophet, had been sent would find pleasing. The prophet had during an assembly of the men of Quraysh after reciting the following verses, Surat and Najm, have you considered Lat and Uzza and Mannat, the third one, chapter 53, verse 19 to 20, added as a result of Satan casting them onto his tongue without his, the prophet, being aware of it. The following words, the those are the high-flying cranes, Al-Gharanik, Al-Ula, and indeed their intercession is to be hoped for. And so they, the men of Quraysh, were thereby delighted. Gabriel, however, later informed him, the prophet, of this, that Satan had cast onto his tongue and he was grieved by it, but was subsequently comforted when this following verse, that he might be reassured of God's pleasure, thereat God abrogates, nullifies whatever Satan had cast, then God confirms his revelations. And God is Noah of Satan's casting of that which has been mentioned, wise in his enabling him to do such things, for he does whatever he wills. That he may make what Satan had cast a trial, a test for those in whose hearts is a sickness, dissension, and hypocrisy, and those whose hearts are hardened, namely the idolaters, against acceptance of the truth. For truly the evildoers, the disbelievers, are steeped in extreme defiance in a protracted feud with the prophet and the believers. For his tongue uttered mention of their gods in a way that pleased them, and yet this was later nullified. As 
you can see, these traditions have been recorded with an authentic chain of narration, and it's impossible to deny them, and the Quran itself testifies to it. When one incident is mentioned from many different chains, it, then it means that there is something very real to this incident, which in this case are Tabari's traditions, whose chain of narration are authentic according to the standards of both Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. While the authors of the tafsir text during the first two centuries of the Islamic era do not seem to have regarded the tradition as in any way inauspicious or unflattering towards Muhammad, it seems to have been universally rejected by at least the 13th century, and most modern Muslims likewise see the tradition as problematic, and rightfully so. This is because by allowing for the intercession of three pagan deities, female pagan deities, they eroded the authority and omnipotence of Allah, and it's viewed as profoundly heretical. The satanic verses also hold a very damaging and damning implications in regard to the Quranic revelation as a whole, because Muhammad's revelation appears to have been based on his desire to appease his fellow people. Many modern Muslim scholars have attempted to put forward reasons to reject this story. This entire matter was condensed into a footnote within religious debate um, and was only rekindled when Salman Rushdie's 1988 novel The Satanic Verses made headline news. The novel contains some fictionalized allusions to Islamic history, um, which provoke both controversy and outrage. Muslims around the world protested the book's publishing, and Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa sentencing Salman Rushdie to death. However, when we look towards secular academics in the West, they have largely accepted the historicity of this incident. So William Montgomery, and Alfred Gwilliam claim that Muhammad must have publicly recited the satanic verses as part of the Quran. They say it's unthinkable that the story could have been invented by Muslims or made up by non-Muslims, and that stories of this event were true based upon the implausibility of Muslims fabricating a story that's just so utterly unflattering towards their own prophet. Furthermore, Maxime Rodinson finds that it may reasonably be accepted as true because the makers of Muslim tradition would have never invented a story with such damaging implications for the revelation as a whole. He writes the following on the genesis of the verses. Obviously, Muhammad's unconscious had suggested to him a formula which provided a practical road to unanimity. So that this concession, however, diminished the threat of the last judgment by enabling the three goddesses to intercede for sinners and save them from eternal damnation. It diminished Muhammad's own authority by giving the priests of Uzza, Manat, and Alat the ability to pronounce oracles contradicting his message. Furthermore, as the Christians and Jews pointed out that he was reverting to his pagan beginnings, combined with opposition and indignation from his own followers, this finally influenced Muhammad to revoke his revelation. However, in doing so, he denounced the gods of Mecca as lesser spirits or mere names, cast off everything related to the traditional religion as the work of pagans and unbelievers, and consigned the Meccan's pious ancestors and relatives to hell. Now, moving on to the second red flag, Umar ibn al-Khattab's contribution to the Quran. Let's take a look at this hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari. Narrated Umar bin al-Khattab, My Lord agreed with me in three things. Number one, I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, I wish we took the station of Abraham as our praying place for some of our prayers. So came the divine inspiration, and take you, people, the station of Abraham as a place of prayer for some of your prayers, example, to Rakat or Tawaf of Kaaba. Quran chapter 2, 125. Number 2. And as regards the verse of the veiling of the women, I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, I wish you ordered your wives to cover themselves from the men because good and bad ones talk to them. So the verse of the veiling of the women was revealed. 
Number three. Once the wives of the prophet made a united front against the prophet, and I said to them, It may be if he, the prophet, divorced you all that his Lord Allah will give him instead of you wives better than you. So this verse, the same as I had said, was revealed. Quran chapter 66 verse 5. So the first thing that Almighty Allah conveniently agrees with Omar on appears in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah or the chapter called the cow and reads as follows. We made the house a resort and a sanctuary for people saying take the spot where Abraham stood as your place of prayer. We commanded Abraham and Ishmael Purify my house for those who walk round it, those who stay there and those who bow and prostrate themselves in worship. The second thing that made it into the Quran, and this is insanely frustrating and has led women to suffer and be oppressed and erased from society for so, so long as a result, is the verse of veiling or the chapter Al-Hijab in Surah An-Nur. So Quran chapter 24 verse 31 reads, And tell the believing women to lower their gaze and guard their chastity and not to reveal their adornments except what normally appears. Let them draw their veils over their chests and not reveal their hidden adornments except to their husbands, their fathers, their fathers-in-law, their sons, their stepsons, their brothers, their brothers' sons or sisters' sons. Bloody hell. How is this eloquent? It's beyond me. Their fellow women women, those bondwomen in their possession, male attendants with no desire, or children who are still unaware of women's nakedness. Let them not stomp their feet, drawing attention to their hidden adornments. Turn to Allah in repentance altogether, O believers, so that you may be successful. Now let's go into a bit of the backstory of how this revelation came about. In Islamic theology, it's called Asbab al-Nuzul, or the context or reason for revelation. If we look into the Asbab al-Nuzul for this particular hijab verse, we will see the situation that led to it. Narrated Aisha, the wives of the Prophet used to go to Al-Manasi, a vast open place near Baki at Medina, to answer the call of nature at night. Omar used to say to the Prophet, let your wives be veiled, but Allah's Apostle did not do so. One night, Sauda bint Zama, the wife of the Prophet, went out at Isha time, and she was a tall lady. Umar addressed her and said, I have recognized you, O Sauda. He said so as he desired eagerly that the verses of Al-Hijab, the observing of veils by the Muslim women, may be revealed. So Allah revealed the verses of Al-Hijab, a complete body cover excluding the eyes. So in cartoon form, this is basically what went down that evening that changed the world forever. And these cartoons are courtesy of ex-Muslims of North America, so thank you to them. As Omar was trying to get women to veil for quite a while, but Muhammad was having none of it, he wasn't really heeding his opinion. In this hadith, we see Omar most likely followed and stalked Sauda in order to harass her in that moment, and then relate the incident to Muhammad making it a personal one, and finally seeing his vision through of making hijab mandatory, and therefore it coming into the Quran. Narrated Anas bin Malik, the verse of Al-Hijab veiling of women was revealed in connection with Zainab bint Jash. On the day of her marriage with him, the Prophet gave a wedding banquet with bread and meat. And she used to boast before other wives of the Prophet and used to say, Allah married me to the Prophet in the heavens. Another hadith reads, it was narrated that Anas said, the Prophet stayed between Khaybar and al Madinah for three days when he consummated his marriage to Safiya bint Huye and I invited the Muslims to his walima, in which there was no bread or meat. Oh, this time there's no bread or meat. He commanded that a leather cloth be spread, and dates, cottage cheese, and ghee were placed on it, and that was his walima. The Muslim said, will she be one of the mothers of the believers, or a female slave who his right hand possesses? They said, 
If he has a hijab for her, then she will be one of the mothers of the believers. And if she does not have a hijab, then she will be a female slave who his right hand possesses, i.e. a sex slave. When he rode on, he set aside a plate for her behind him and extended a hijab between her and the people. So the Prophet actually elevated her rank from a potential sex slave to a wife in this incident um, based on that very detail of extending a hijab. So the point I want to make here is that we can see that the hijab is discriminatory and reserved for believing women and wives only. This eventually causes a hierarchy between women in society and it systematically leaves the slave women vulnerable to sexual assault and harassment as this is literally the distinction that's canonized in the Quran where it says, tell the believing women to lower their gaze and guard their chastity. It does not extend that command to non-believers or slave women. In Quran chapter 33 verse 59, it reads, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to bring down over themselves part of their outer garments. That is more suitable that they will be known and not be abused. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. So it clearly states that the reason these believing women should observe the veil is so that they will be known to Muslim men and not be abused. Abused. Yusuf Ali's translation actually uses the word molested. It's clear to see, therefore, that unveiled women and slave women are, by extension, entirely susceptible to abuse and molestation by these Muslim men. In this hadith, we see that Omar even disapproves of a slave girl who was veiled, and he disapproved of her impersonating a believing woman. Malik related to me that he heard that Umar ibn al-Khattab saw a female slave belonging to Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab. She was dressed like a free, non-slave woman. He went to his daughter Hafsa and said, didn't I see your brother's slave girl dressed like a free, non-slave woman walking among the people and causing trouble? Omar disapproved of that. The third supposed agreement between Almighty Allah and Omar is featured in Quran's chapter 66. His Lord may well replace you with better wives if the Prophet decides to divorce any of you who are devoted to God, true believers, devout, and who turn to him in repentance and worship him, given to fasting, whether previously married or virgins. So there we have three separate instances in which Omar's words have made a direct appearance in the Quran once again shattering the notion that the word of God and the Quran were always in existence. It also shatters the notion that the Quran was the direct word of God sent down to Prophet Muhammad via the angel Gabriel. Just to keep tabs, so far we've seen Satan's words make it into the Quran, followed by Umar Khattab's words make it into the Quran. Right, let's move to the final major red flag, the story of Abdullah Sar the first ex-Muslim and apostate. So this guy is low-key a legend. He was the very first apostate. I have a lot of respect for him, realizing something isn't true and cutting it off right away. Um, but yeah, right, let's get into it. In the early days of Islam, Muhammad had scribes who would write his so-called revelations down for him. One such scribe was called Abdullah ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Sar. For simplification, we'll call him Abdullah Sir in this video. As Abdullah Sir possessed certain literary skills when he was writing down these revelations in the company of the Prophet, he, let's say, frequently made suggestions to improve their wording. Problem here is that Muhammad often agreed with these edits and allowed the changes to be made and written as the Quran and de facto word of Allah. The changes that Abdullah suggested were accepted and were accepted with enough frequency that it actually caused Abdullah Sar to realize that something was shady about this whole thing. Abdullah thought if a mere scribe was allowed to change something, then how was it proclaimed to be the word of God? By that token, if Muhammad was inspired, then so was Abdullah in the exact same way. Abdullah eventually left Islam and lived in Mecca because he rightfully came to the realization that these revelations could not be from God. So naturally, upon leaving Islam, Abdullah became a direct threat to the credibility of the Quran. If a man had been allowed to edit and change the word of God, it would no longer be believed to be 
the literal word of God. So this threat to the credibility of the Quran was also a direct threat to Muhammad's credibility as a messenger or, or a prophet or apostle of God, because no real or genuine prophet would allow the word of God to be changed. Now, if we fast forward to some time later, Muhammad and his army moved on Mecca and they took it without a fight. On that day, Muhammad ordered the murder of 10 people living in Mecca. Abdullah Sar was one of the people Muhammad ordered to be murdered that day. His crime, you ask? He had apostatized and left Islam, and he constituted a threat to the credibility of the Quran and the prophethood of Muhammad. It's no wonder then that Muhammad wanted him dead. So let's take a look at what the Islamic sources say. Quran chapter 23 verse 14, Surah Al-Mu'minum, or the chapter of the believers in English, is also where the Quran gets the description of embryology wrong. No surprises there. Listen carefully to the words here though, because the last line in this verse are the very words of Abdullah Sir himself. Thereafter, we created the sperm drop into a clot or embryo, and then we created the clot into a chewed up morsel, and then we created the chewed up morsel into bones, then we dressed the bones in flesh, thereafter we brought him into being as another creation. So supremely blessed be Allah, the fairest of creators. Here's an Islamic source that confirms Abdullah's addition into Quran chapter 23 verse 14. This is quoted from the famous Tafsir Anwar al-Tanzil wa Asrar al-Ta'wil by Abdullah ibn Umar al-Baidawi. Al-Baidawi comments on the Quran, Surah An-Nam chapter 6 verse 93. To me, it has been revealed when naught has been revealed to him, refers to Abdullah ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Sar, who used to write for God's messenger. The verse, chapter 23, verse 12, that says, we created man of an extraction of clay, was revealed. And when Muhammad reached the part that says, thereafter we produced him as another creature, which is 2314, Abdullah said, so blessed be God, Abdullah said, let's focus on that, Abdullah said, so blessed be God, the fairest of creators, in amazement at the detail of man's creation by the prophet. And what did the prophet say? The prophet said, write it down, for thus it has been revealed. Abdullah doubted and said, if Muhammad is truthful, then I receive the revelation as much as he does. And if he's a liar, what I said is as good as what he said. So not only do we see the words of Abdullah clearly made their way into the Quran, but the Quran goes even further and comments on him in Surah An-Nam, ch uh, chapter 6, verse 93, where the tafsir tells us that the line, to me it has been revealed, where naught has been revealed to him, literally refers to Abdullah Sar. But wait, the Quran still isn't finished with Abdullah just yet. <laughs> Further along in Surah An-Nam, or the chapter of the cattle in English, the Quran says, who could be more wicked than someone who invents a lie against God? Or claims, a revelation has come to me when no revelation has been sent to him. Or says, I too can reveal something equal to God's revelation. If you could only see the wicked in their death agonies as the angels stretch out their hands to them saying, give up your souls. Today you will be repaid with a humiliating punishment for saying false things about God and for arrogantly rejecting his revelations. This verse was also revealed to Muhammad on account, how convenient, on account of Abdullah Sahar exposing Muhammad for accepting his words into the Quran. Here's the Islamic source on it. From Al-Sirah by Al-Iraqi. Al-Iraqi refers to the specific line in chapter 6 verse 93, who could be more wicked than someone who invents a lie against God, or claims, a revelation has come to me when no revelation has been sent to him, or says, I too can reveal something equal to God's revelation. The scribes of Muhammad were 42 in number. Abdullah ibn Sahar al-Amiri was one of them, and he was the first Qurayshi amongst those who wrote in Mecca before he turned away from Islam. He started saying, I used to direct Muhammad wherever I willed. He would dictate to me, most high, all wise, and I would write down all wise only. Then he would say, yes, it is all the same. On a certain occasion, he said, write such and such, but I wrote, write only. And he said, write whatever you like. Write whatever you like. 
So when this scribe exposed Muhammad, he wrote in the Quran, and who does greater evil than he who forges against God a lie, or says, to me it has been revealed when naught has been revealed to him. So on the day Muhammad conquered Mecca, he commanded his scribe to be killed. But the scribe fled to Uthman ibn Affan because Uthman was his foster brother. His mother suckled Uthman. Uthman therefore kept him away from Muhammad. After the people had calmed down, Uthman brought the scribe to Muhammad and sought protection for him. Muhammad kept silent for a long time, after which he said yes. When Uthman had left, Muhammad said, I only kept silent so that you, the people, should kill him. Now, let's take a look at what the Sirat Rasulullah says about the conquest of Mecca. And also please do note that the Sirat Rasulullah, um, the biography of the Prophet by Ibn Hisham, is one of the earliest and most authentic biographies of Muhammad. It was written even before the Hadith were compiled. So quoting from The Life of Muhammad, page 550, the Apostle had instructed his commanders when they entered Mecca only to fight those who resisted them, except a small number who were to be killed, even if they were found beneath the curtains of the Kaaba. Among them was Abdullah bin Sa'ad, brother of the Bani Amir bin Lu'ay. The reason he ordered him to be killed was that he had been a Muslim and used to write down revelation. Then he apostatized and returned to Quraysh, Mecca, and fled to Uthman bin Afan, whose foster brother he was. Uthman was one of Muhammad's closest friends and later became the Caliph of Islam. The latter hid him until he brought him to the Apostle after the situation in Mecca was tranquil and asked that he might be granted immunity. They alleged that the Apostle remained silent for a long time till he finally said yes granting Abdullah immunity from the execution order. When Uthman had left, he, Muhammad, said to his companions who were sitting around him, I kept silent so that one of you might get up and strike off his head. One of the Ansar, Muhammad's helpers from Medina, said, Then why didn't you give me a sign, O Apostle of God? He, Muhammad, answered, that a prophet does not kill by pointing. So in Arabia, it was a known custom at that time by all the Arabs in any warfare that a person found clenching to the drapes of the Kaaba would be spared. So the pagan Arabs, when they were at war, wouldn't kill a person who was clenching onto the drapes of the Kaaba. Yet Muhammad ordered the killing of six unarmed people, two of which were women, even if they were clenching onto the drapes of the Kaaba. Really makes you wonder if Islam is the religion of peace that they try to promote. So just to summarize that portion of the biography, after Muhammad took Mecca and issued the order to kill Abdullah, he was sheltered by Uthman, who was a close companion of Muhammad, and Abdullah essentially pled for amnesty, even though Muhammad in reality wanted one of his men to kill him on the spot, but obviously as they couldn't read his mind, they didn't know whether or not they should kill him, and so finally Muhammad had to, out of obligation, grant him amnesty. And finally, just to highlight the extent of the religion of peace of Muhammad, we find the names on a list of the 10 people that Muhammad ordered to be killed that day, again, straight from Islamic sources. This is found in the Kitab al-Tabaqat, Al-Kabir. It's found on volume 2, page 168. Muhammad ordered the execution of 10 people when he took Mecca. Here is the list. The Apostle of Allah entered through Adakhir into Mecca and prohibited fighting. He ordered six men and four women to be killed. They were Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahal, number two Habar ibn al-Aswad, number three Abdullah ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Sar, that's our guy we're talking about in this video, Mikyas ibn Sababa al-Laythi, al huwayrith ibn Nukayt, Abd Abah ibn Hilal ibn Khatal al-Adrami, Hind bin Utba, Sara the Molat of Amr ibn Hashim, Fartana, and Qareba. So, what conclusion can we draw from this? Well, it's clear to see that Muhammad really, really wanted Abdullah dead, but he handled the entire incident very haphazardly. Muhammad issues an edict to have a man executed, but then fails to carry it out because he doesn't think it's worthy of him as a prophet to make a signal with his hand or a wink with his eye because he is a prophet and they should just be able to read his mind. So another question, why didn't Muhammad kill him himself? If this man had in fact committed such a heinous crime that actually constitutes death in that time, according to the law, why didn't Muhammad see that his death sentence be carried out? What kind of law is that? 
That's basically like saying you've committed a major crime punishable by death, but I'm going to let you live because I'm too proud to signal with my hand in the presence of Uthman. And remember that the Quran chapter 6 verse 93 literally refers to Abdullah Sar as wicked. Who could be more wicked than someone who invents a lie against God? What this actually shows is that Muhammad gave orders ad hoc and off the cuff. This man had committed no major crime. He simply had exposed Muhammad as a charlatan and by extension exposed the Quran. Thus Muhammad really, really wanted him dead for personal reasons, clearly. But in short, many people essentially in that time at the behest of Muhammad lived or died simply based on arbitrary reasons. And usually those arbitrary reasons were dependent on Muhammad's frame of mind in that moment and not really based on any sound concept of law and justice. Many Muslims today proclaim that the Quran is the speech of Allah revealed in its precise meaning and wording through the angel Gabriel, transmitted by many inimitable, unique and protected by Allah himself against any corruption. Allah himself against any corruption. Yet, we find that the Quran has suffered a fair bit of corruption. The sources presented in this video in relation to these incidents are from early, sincere and dedicated Muslim writers. These were devout Muslims, they weren't moderates, they weren't liberals who actually would want to change the face of real Islam for their own purpose or to fulfill their own agenda. Even in the historical writings of Islam, we find plenty of proof relating to the Quran's corruption, even at its inception. I'd like Muslims to take a moment of pause and genuinely reflect on this point, um, particularly when the perfect Quran has the audacity, sorry, the perfect Quran has the audacity to state that the Bible and the Torah were corrupted, even though they present no evidence for the original text and when exactly this corruption took place. I'll end this video by stating that the remnants of the blasphemous satanic verses, as well as Umar ibn Khattab's God-sanctioned opinions, and the additions of Abdullah ibn Sa'ar, are all still part of the Quran today. Infallible? I think not. If you think that this shatters the claims that the Quran is perfect among the myriad of other reasons, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks everybody for watching and for all your love and support and for helping me and my channel get this much um, response and traction at, you know, in such a short time. I really appreciate it. If you do like my work and you want to support me, then you can support me on PayPal or Patreon. Um, they're both in, in the description. And also, please don't feel shy. Let me know if there's certain topics that you want videos on. You can um, DM me on Twitter or you can email me at holyhumanist at gmail.com, which is also in the description, and it's also on the about page on this YouTube channel. But yeah, till next time, stay free, stay happy, and love and light, everybody. Bye. If you like these videos and want to support me in my activism, then you can support me on Patreon or PayPal. Stay free, everyone.